Hey, how's it going? I am here once again with Brian Garcia and Brock Wiggum. And uh, we wanted to just kind of get together and chat a little bit about the um, Trinity. And uh, there's been some stuff going on with Sean McCraney that probably lots of you guys know about. And Sean's uh, current struggle with the doctrine of the Trinity. And I think it's really interesting that um, all three of us here have struggled with the Trinity as well from different perspectives, I guess. So um, why, why don't we start this conversation there? Uh, Brock, why don't you tell me a little bit about your struggle with the Trinity? Well, I was... Uh... I thought he was going to choke on his coffee. <laughs> um, yeah, my struggle with the Trinity comes from, of course, a, a Jehovah's Witness background, just like like with Brian. And, um, I really done, didn't know how to reconcile uh, the divinity of Jesus, nor did I even really think about it that much. Um, I can think about when I was uh, studying as a Jehovah's Witness, we would study books called The Greatest Man Who Ever Lived in our uh, book studies. That would happen every Thursday. And one of the things I, I I respected Jesus a lot when I saw the charity that he offered other people, um, when I would see the miracles that he would do, um, I saw through the filter of, well, that's God really acting through Jesus, but I could never really reconcile it in my mind and in my heart well, with who, who really is Jesus, you know? Right. And so I just kind of just accepted it as he's an agent of, of God the Father and um, just kind of like a vice president would be to a to a president, he's an acting agent, but really not God Himself. Uh, but uh, that's pretty much what I'll say for now. As yeah, that's how kind I of where you were. Okay, yeah, so exactly. so so Jehovah God was president. Jesus Christ was vice right. president, acting on His behalf. How about you, Brian? Well, Brock and I are both ex Jehovah's Witnesses, so we kind of have the same concept. You know, Jehovah's Witnesses have a universal concept of who Jesus is, who Jehovah is. They also have a universal rejection of the Trinity as pagan, Babylonish, Catholic nonsense. Mm -hmm. um, oh, that is not my coffee. <laughs> oh, that's gross. But we, what we do, <laughs> but what we do, uh, kind of find, um, other than the core concepts of who Jehovah is, who Jesus is, and who the Holy Spirit is, and Jehovah and the Jehovah's Witnesses, um, it's just a the, the Trinity was just so confusing to me as a Jehovah's Witness apologist. Um, I remember once making a video on YouTube, and it's still on YouTube, where I took you know, two other people, my two cousins, and I, and I brought them on, onto the camera, and I said, okay, the Trinitarians say that there's three persons in God. Well, let's count. There's one person, there's another person, there's another person, that's three persons. I remember are, that video. Yeah, and we <laughs> are distinct. We are just like, and I, and I use Trinitarian language, look, we're distinct. We are uh, you know, of, of the same nature because we're humans but we are three people the trinity is polytheism and so and that's just the way it was perceived because of, of the wording that was used uh, by trinitarians which is something that sean mccraney has talked about he says that the language that we use regarding the trinity confuses uh mormons as it confuses jehovah's witnesses as it did to me yeah, and, and I, I was never a Jehovah's Witness. I was Catholic, and it was interesting when I came out of Catholicism on my way to you know becoming a born again believer in Jesus Christ. Um, I rejected everything that was Catholic at that point. You know, um, I didn't want anything to do with Catholicism. I viewed the Trinity as a Catholic doctrine, as something born out of Catholicism. You know, something that must have come from a pope or something like that. So I rejected the Trinity too. I just threw you know the baby out with the bathwater, so to speak. And um, it wasn't until later that, um, in, in through reading the Bible, that that I came to. Uh, understand and receive the Trinity as well. So, um, Brian, let's, let's start this one with you. So, what was, how did you begin to reconcile? I mean, not get all the way there, but what, what was like the first step for you in reconciling the Trinity uh, with the Bible? And, and I know we want to be careful with the grammar here and the language that we're using, um, but we will use, we'll use the word Trinity because yeah, I think yeah. most people understand what we mean by that. Yeah, so... It all started coming around when, you know, encountering the scriptures and seeing that one of the consistent wordings or phrases used is there's only one God. You know, all throughout Genesis, all throughout the Deuteronomy, all throughout, you know, Psalms, Isaiah, Ezekiel, even into the New Testament, there's always that idea of strict monotheism. There's only one God. 
all other gods are, you know, even Paul said that there are so-called gods and lords out there, but they're not true gods or true lords. They're false gods. Um, and so consistently through the Old and New Testament, we see um, there's only one God. And so in the Jehovah's Witness theology, Jesus is a God. And it became more and more alarming as I began to understand biblical monotheism in that there can only be one God. And Jehovah himself says in Isaiah, before me, there was no God. And after me, there will continue to be none. So why would Jehovah purposely create a God to continue after him, so to speak, if he himself said there is no God before or after him? And so that's when it began making sense to me that, okay, if Jesus is truly a God or the God, there's a problem that needs to be reconciled with God's nature as to how is God one and how is God distinct in, in, with his nature. Right. And, it, and, and I think a lot of people would be interesting to know because I think most people watching know that you and I have yeah. talked for a long time. <laughs> and uh, even before you were a Christian, while you were still a Jehovah's yeah. Witness, you and I had a pretty friend, friendly relationship. And I, and I think that a lot of people think that um, what we as Christians do is we ram the Trinity down your throat and everything like that. We're, we're pushing that, pushing that, pushing that. And um, when I think back on our conversations, we rarely talked about mm -hmm. the Trinity, I don't think. And, um, and actually, we talked a lot. didn't even talk about uh, biblical stuff. <laughs> we just kind of, yeah. you know, we, we talked about a lot of other stuff. We did talk about Jesus and stuff, yeah. but, um, you know, it wasn't about ramming the Trinity down your throat. How about you, Brock? Uh, for me, it was really just getting an understanding of, what, like Brian was talking about, what is the nature of God? You know, you'd think that that would be such, that would, should be your starting point for any discussion. Uh, on the on the Trinity uh, or or anything for that matter, but I think when I talk to Jehovah's Witnesses, that's usually the first question that comes across my table is let's talk about the Trinity. Do you get that, Brian? When witnesses, maybe both of you. Yeah. That is not the Which first Brian thing. Are you talking to? Both Brian. Okay. Because yeah. you gotta both, say Brian. We both so you get that. We both get Jehovah's Witnesses talking to us, and that's usually the first subject, and. We don't really get to the meat of the issue, which is what is the essence or nature of God, right? And so, really, for my understanding of the Trinity, I didn't want to start with with the doctrine of the Trinity. I needed to start with the doctrine of God, and that is who is God. And when I read Isaiah 43, uh, like Brian was talking about, actually, why don't we just turn there, Isaiah 43. And it's one that the witnesses use so often. It's already got their name. Yeah, it's got their name in it. That's uh, Isaiah chapter 43, starting in verse 10. All right, and that says, You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, Jehovah, Yahweh, and my, server, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be after me. So you see, Jehovah is setting himself apart from all these pagan gods before him. You know, he's talking to Isaiah. This is Jehovah speaking to him. It says, I am the Lord, and besides me there is no Savior. Really important to underline that. It's because I, I remember asking my dad, how do we justify calling Jesus a Savior? <laughs> it doesn't make any sense. And it says, I am the Lord, besides me there is no Savior. I declared and saved and proclaimed when there was no strange God among you. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and I am God. And henceforth I am He. There is none who can deliver you from my hand. I work, and who can turn it back? For me, the, the linchpin was understanding the nature of God. He is uniquely God because before Him, there is no God nor shall there be after him. He has no beginning. God has no end. You know, there's lots of attributes that we have to start with when it comes to the nature of God. And if you do not fit that criteria about the nature of who God is, you know, Satan, we can call him a God, but he is, a, is he a true God? He, he, by nature, is a created being. He has a beginning. So he is not a true God. He is a false God. Right. So that's where we, where we really have to start the discussion and say, well, what kind of what criteria does Jesus fit into? What what is his nature? That's the next question. See, and, and that's kind of where it was for me too. And Isaiah was a was a big help to me in understanding that Jesus was God, understanding the divinity of Christ, because 
I, I, when you read through the book of Isaiah, there are all these defenses that God makes for himself. I am God because I do this. I am God because I am the only Savior. I am God because I am the only Redeemer. I am God because I am the Creator. And then all of a sudden you come back later and you see um, Jesus, all this stuff being applied to Jesus. So, so you have Jehovah God in the Old Testament saying, this is what makes me God. This is my defense that I am the only true God. And then, boom, it's all thrown on Jesus in the New Testament. So, um, yeah, what would make God the Father, or what would make Jehovah God unique with this created being Jesus, if Jesus has all the same attributes that God has? And um, I know the whole law of, um, the Hebrew law of agency argument, I've already done a video on that, so I'm not going to talk about it here, but that doesn't explain it. You know, you can't just pawn it off on agency and say, well, you know, the title was, you know, compared to him or given to him because um, he did it as Jehovah's agent. Well, then you can call me Jehovah because one of the things that Jesus did was he, he, he spread the good news as Jehovah's agent. And I, and I go out and spread the good news too, but you certainly wouldn't call me Jehovah, right. you know, because I'm, because I'm acting as his agent, so to speak, in, in the proclamation of the gospel. So, um, you know, that whole Hebrew law of agency, number one, it's, it's not something that the Hebrews actually even really used. They, they only used it in the sense that um, it's really more the Roman law of agency. You know, it's, it's more of a secular um, business type thing right. that, the Hebrews, right, that the Hebrews were adopting for their own business practices. It right. wasn't even a theological concept that they had. So um, that's anachronistically read back into uh, history right. and, and now being misapplied to God. So um, let's talk about some of the Trinitarian uh, terminology, though, because um, I, I know that you wanted to talk about it, and probably you as well, because some of the terminology gets confusing. Yeah. And, uh, and so let's just talk real quickly about um, how we need to be careful with the terminology that we use. Yeah, well, we're, we're here 2,000 years after the New Testament's completion. And as... Unitarians as people who are modalists or whatever, people who are usually opposed to the Trinity, um, usually point out, which is true, that a lot of the phrases that we use regarding the Trinity, like the word Trinity is not in the Bible. It comes from a Greek Latin word that, you know, Trinitas, which means three and one. Um, we have a, a plethora of words, you know, even just using the word persons in relation to the persons of God, of, you know, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, referring to them as persons, and then saying, but well, they're of one substance or one essence. Um, and a lot of things that we don't really see formulated in the scriptures, and yet we also, we, we have a reason for using them. So it's, it becomes very confusing, even for us who have been, you know, acquainted with this language for quite some time now, who have studied it, who have accepted it. Uh, and we can understand where the struggles lie in when it comes to the terminologies that Trinitarians use. And so I think one of the things that we could do, as Sean McCraney pointed out, is update our language to something that's more biblical and sound, and, and that people will understand because when we talk about, like I mentioned earlier, we talk about persons, we think of what we have here. We have three persons on the stage. We have three persons talking to each other, communicating with each other. And those are words and, and phrases we use in relation to the Trinity. Right. And so how can we, you know, and, and, it's, and this is also part of the mystery, how can we explain the vastness and the greatness and the, the majesty of the Creator God? Right. And so, you know, how do we put him, the indescribable, indescribable God, into a describable, describable manner? <laughs> right, and it's interesting that you use the word mystery because that's like a key word for Jehovah's Witnesses. They hear mystery and it's like, boom, you yeah. know, then they shut down when they hear that word mystery because there can be no mystery. In my argument, that would be, look, you, you know, you can call it a trinity, you can call it whatever you want, but the Bible clearly teaches that there is one God. And, and we agree that the Bible teaches that there's one God. And, and where the root of the argument lies is that the Bible also teaches that, um, that there's God the Father, that, that Jesus is God, and the Bible clearly teaches that the Holy Spirit is God. Yet the Bible maintains a strict monotheism. So we use the word Trinity for that. We say something like, well, it's a mystery or, or, or whatever, and we struggle for language to try to describe it. But, you know, you got to think, we're talking about um, the, the only being that is uncreated. Mm -hmm. 
everything else, whether the sun, the moon, the stars, you, me, you know, um, you know, your cat, whatever. I mean, everything is created by God. We're talking about the one thing that exists outside of creation, and that's God. So there should be no surprise that there's no words within the box of creation to describe what's on the outside of the box of creation. Right. And another, it's wholly other. Another thing, too, is I know that once we start talking about terms that are not biblical, I know that Jehovah's Witnesses also jump on that. Well, Trinity is not found in the Bible, right? Um, and I know that that's oftentimes jumped on by a Jehovah's Witness to say, well, therefore it cannot be true if you're using unbiblical terms. Uh, I want to first of all say that I, I think many times when we're when we have a when we have a Greek civilization that we're trying to to answer to, you know, when they demand, you know, through their philosophical systems that an answer or a reply for our faith, oftentimes we we really do have to go and use terms outside the Bible to describe biblical concepts. You know, we even do that today with updated languages. You know, we don't have the same Greek or Aramaic language as they do, so we have to use our own language to try to describe a concept that is really a biblical concept. Like, for example, uh, you know, the Bible having a personal <laughs> having a personal relationship with God. You know, that's right. that's not in the Bible, but you can clearly see it when you read scriptures like this means everlasting life that they came to know you. Well, what does that mean? It's a spe specific type of knowledge, and we would describe that as a relationship. So even though it's an extra biblical term, it clearly describes the concept in the Bible itself. And so I think it can be abused to use extra biblical concepts, just like governing body, for example. <laughs> you don't see that. Yeah, governing body, theocratic ministry school, right. you know, all sorts of stuff like that. You don't see those in the Bible. Right, but it's but just, just to kind of knock down the argument, because I know what a Jehovah's Witness is probably thinking up to this point. Right. So. Okay, now, now in all fairness, I, I, I've heard a lot about what um, Sean McCraney has said and the things going on with him, but I haven't had the time to go watch the videos or anything like that, so I'm not going to comment too much on anything specific that he said. But I, I do want to ask you guys this question, okay? You know, you come out of a background like Jehovah's Witnesses, or you come out of a background like Mormons, you know, and you receive Jesus Christ and everything, and as you're learning and as you're growing and as you're being sanctified and everything, um, I, I think that there could be times in your life where you begin to wrestle with doctrines, maybe the doctrine of the Trinity or the doctrine of hell. So I would look at what Sean McCraney is doing um, as, as possibly, and I, and, I, and I don't know for sure, but it could quite possibly be a healthy wrestling mm -hmm. with a very important doctrine. I mean, in a big doctrine, in a deep doctrine. And uh, what, do, what do you think about that? Yeah, I, I think, I, I definitely think that... Uh, it's okay to wrestle with a mystery. It's okay. I mean, we, 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 we do so even now in, in Christendom with Arminianism and Calvinism. And so, you know, the way I reconcile those two arguments in that, yes, I believe there's free will. Yes, I believe God's sovereign. And so, I mean, it's like I, I heard a pastor say to me once, uh, before on the, on the gate of heaven, it says, whoever so may come. When you pass through that gate, it says, when you look behind, it says on the, on, on the gate, chosen before the foundation of the earth. So we, we wrestle with that mystery. It's the same thing with, 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 with the person of Christ, the same thing with the Trinity, in that we wrestle with it. Um, and I think what Sean McCraney was was uh, kind of arguing against, too, was a lot of the terminology. I think he put his foot in his mouth when he said the Trinity was garbage, and that it was pagan, and that the terminologies around it were of pagan origin. Um, but there's also some truth to that. Uh, and so we, we do have to look at er, all the available sources, everything that has been uh, written through the centuries, and, uh, and, and totally rely on this book, that this is the source and the foundation of our faith. That isn't the creeds. It isn't, you know, the creeds, what they are meant to do is to reaffirm what's in the scriptures. Right. And so there are also things in the creeds that are not biblical, and that's okay because we always go back to the source. This right. is the source. And, and I think we've got to be careful with going back to those sources, too, because I think he quoted his law. Alexander uh, Hislop. Yeah, yeah he, he quoted Hislop, and Hislop, if you want to look him up, is is probably one of the sloppiest, I can't even call him a scholar, I don't know what he is. He, he also like, used the the, 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 the oblet uh, uh, yeah. yeah, the emphatic diagonal, yeah. right, Benjamin Wilson and things like that. And, you know, if, as, as far as a watchtower goes, you know, I could, I could sit here and say, well, you know what, I'm going to reject the watchtower society because what a watchtower was, was um, when you made a military camp, you would build this big tower, 
and you would stand up there and it was a weapon of war, so to speak. You know, I mean, I mean that would be ridiculous for me to, to reject the Watchtower on that basis. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know... But I, but I do want to talk about, real quickly, about more so does the, the debate of the Trinity itself, because instead of uh, talking about like all the terminology, like what is the Trinity exactly? Like what, in the scriptures, what, what, using biblical language, how would we describe the Trinity? Here's how I would describe it. I, I would describe the Trinity very basically um, in, in the sense that the Bible teaches that there is one God, Deuteronomy 6. It teaches, obviously, God the Father is God. Nobody argues that. I mean, um, uh, you know, there are verses that say explicitly that Jesus is God. And, and uh, we can go to um, uh, Acts 5 and see that it's, it's explicitly said that the Holy Spirit is God. And, and based on that, what I'm left with, uh, I'm left with an infallible book that tells me there, there are three persons, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, that are all God. That are named that because yeah. of their relationship with one another. Well, it says specifically that they are God. It says the Word was God. Um, you know, it, it says that you didn't lie to man, you lied to God in reference to the Holy Spirit. Right. right, so they are God, yet the Bible says that there is one God. And I can rest in that. I'm done there. At, at that point, I'm done. I don't have to argue with the scriptures. I don't have to say, well, I have to understand that and be able to describe that in a perfect way or, or create a bunch of terms to describe it any more than I need to create a bunch of terms to describe how God created out of nothing or how God spoke things into existence. You know, I don't have to try to explain that stuff. It says that, you know, we, we, we know that it says that that's what happened in the Bible. And I say, okay, I, I'm cool. I'm going to roll with that. I think lots of witnesses get kind of thrown off, or actually, not only witnesses, but uh, modalists too, uh, Unitarians, by the terms father and son. They might be thinking in their minds some sort of chronological order, because when there's a father, there's a son, and that's kind of, the, that's kind of what trips them up a little bit, right. is the terms that we use. Right. And we would say, or at least I would say, I don't want to speak for you too, but I would say that those are terms of relationship. Right. And, uh, and, and, and that's taking God and using terms for God, biblical terms, because those are biblical terms, and, and, and putting them into a way that we can understand yeah. what's being said. So let me just pose the question then. Would we label a brother who we know, anathema, or a heretic, if they describe the nature of God in this manner, that there is one God... And within that one God, we, we know him as the Father. We know that the Father has a word because he speaks and he speaks all things into creation. We know that the Father has a spirit because he is a spirit being. And so we see that in the incarnation, in the beginning was the word, the word became flesh. The word was God, he became flesh. So God's, God's word that was always within him became flesh. And we know that God's spirit is always working and uh, not independently of the authority of the Father, but always within the Father. So if someone, and, and because a lot of times when you describe the Trinity or Godhead in that manner, people automatically switch to say that's, that's modalism. He's talking about modes. What if that person also affirms the distinction in persons, in the persons of, of, of the distinction between the word and the source of the Father? There's a yeah. distinction between them. I wouldn't be quick to call that anathema. I would say it was... Um, it's not language that I would use personally, um, but but I tend to go. I tend to just want to rely just on the biblical language. Um, I, well, wouldn't that seem closer to the biblical language than, let's say, the creeds? I, I have a problem with the with the with the creed in the sense that it says that, that the son proceeds from the father. Mm -hmm. You know, um, because I don't find that in in the scriptures. Um, so yeah, so I, I I have a problem with that. I'm not saying it's anathema. I'm not saying anything like yeah. that. I'm just saying that once again it goes beyond it goes beyond the simple formula of the Trinity right. that, that I've already spoken of, right. which is the one that I'm comfortable with. It, 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 there's a distinction between father, son, spirit. There are, there are three distinct um, persons. Um, so yeah, that that would go beyond what I'm comfortable with. Right. But would you would you label that as modalism? Um, I think see, it comes pretty close. <laughs> yeah, it, <laughs> it, it, it comes pretty close. But there's there's where you fall into the problem with the language. I mean, as soon as you start going beyond what the scriptures say, you know, and saying, okay, I'm just going to grab onto that truth, hold onto yeah. that truth, and roll with that truth. As soon as you begin to start, you know, getting into this ontological stuff that, that um, the Bible doesn't speak too much about. I mean, we, we get insights into God's character and insights into stuff like that. But as soon as you get into that ontological language, I, I think 
you start to breed problems yeah. because you could somebody could say proceed and, and I think of proceed in a certain way as yeah, a yeah. generation or something like that and um, it, it's all how those terms are perceived by the hearer without really uh, being extraordinarily precise with your language which you mean by every word I think it takes us to a place that we don't need to go right right and uh, that's that's the whole point with with the, with the watch with the watchtower has to struggle with at this point is even though they say on one hand that we believe in one God Jehovah they still have to wrestle with the fact that they have a God Jesus that's what it really comes down to for for me and I think with Brian as well and the sermon that he preached today is what do you do with this a God is he a true God or a false God we're talking about Jesus how do how do you wrestle with that because the moment you say that Jesus is a true God but only an agent you automatically have two gods. <laughs> right. And that, that's the that's the problem that it comes up with, and that's not scriptural, and that's seen when it, that was seen as heresy with, uh, with the uh, Arminius, right? And, and we've got like, I, I think we've probably got like one minute left, so I want to talk about this wrestling with this idea of, of who God and his nature and everything like that, and being gracious about it. Yeah. Um, being gracious about it, because people should wrestle with who God is. Yeah. Give, give me like 30 seconds. So I, I don't think you're a Christian is saved by their confession of the Nicene Creed or the the uh, Athanasius Creed or any Trinitarian Creed out there. I think you're confessed by, you, you confess with your mouth to Jesus, Lord, you believe in your heart that God raised you from the dead and you will be saved. And so I, 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 can, I can lead someone who is dying to salvation by that verse. Without, the, without, without the, the, teaching them the Trinity. Yeah, exactly. Okay. And so, but ultimately, if you are a Christian and you're walking in Him, I think you will begin to understand there's complexity in the nature of God, that there's divinity in, in the three persons of the Godhead and that okay. they're equally God. Okay. Give me 30 seconds on that, Brock. Well, I, I wrestle with the concept just as much as I wrestle with God not being born. <laughs> so, right. what? And, but I accept it at face value with what the scriptures right. say. So just like you said, uh, I, I see clear verses where Jesus is claiming equality with God. Uh, but he's submissive to God at the right. same time, and so uh, that's what I take at face value. And even though I claim, even though I admit readily that I don't understand the complexities behind it, and I'll only figure that out in eternity. Right. Yeah. And, and I would agree with the both of you two that um, I, I can lead somebody to the Lord who's who's got thirty seconds to live by by sharing the simple gospel with them that Jesus Christ died for their sins. And when they place, when you place your faith in Him, that He died for your sins, that He rose again on that third day. When you make that confession, believe it in your heart, you will be saved. And um, if you're out there and you're wrestling with the Trinity and you're wrestling with these issues, man, wrestle away. But go to the Bible to do it. That that would be my one thing: is go to the Bible to do it, and uh, and, and go in prayer, and and uh, and let God work within your heart for that. So. Uh, appreciate it. Thanks for watching and uh, appreciate you guys being here. Yeah. Amen. Amen. God bless.